Good morning, Heritage Church. Good to be a part of your service today and your weekend and your life, literally. I, I love this church. I know you love this church. It is a special place. What happened this morning doesn't happen everywhere. I know you know that, but the Spirit of God is here and Jesus is magnified and lives are being changed. And thank you for taking care of my grandchildren too. I appreciate that. But it's always good to be with you and we want to continue what we were talking about this weekend. Iron sharpens iron, leaving a legacy. And this is not just for men, it's for all of us. I want to encourage you as you live life with meaning and with purpose. I want to encourage you that wherever you are in life, whether young or old, to stay the course, run the race, and finish well. We don't finish the race until we hit the finish line. That's when we see Jesus. Either in his coming or in our going, we run the race. I want to encourage you in that today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I just want to look at two verses, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a large crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord for your grace, for your mercy, for your inspiration. Lord, for the power of your spirit that dwells within all of us. Pray, Lord, that you would bless our time today as we study your word and that, Father, we might take these truths, implement them into our lives so that we might run the race of the Christian life with endurance and with perseverance and with faith. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. The Christian life is a race, and it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a distance race. I've always wanted to be a competitive runner since I was really young. But as you can tell from my, from my body type, it's really not suited for that. And I, I, but I, I wanted to race. I wanted to be a competitive runner, and I, I wasn't very fast, so I knew it would not be sprinting. I'm not very small, so distance race would be a challenge. But when I was in college, I started jogging, not running, jogging. And I decided to enter a race, to enter a 5K. I was in pretty good shape, so I thought. So I entered this 5K race, and I'm running the race. I'm certainly not winning the race. I'm not in the back of the race. I'm somewhere in the middle of the pack, but I'm running the race, and I'm feeling pretty good, and I see the finish line. Oh, it's on out a couple of hundred yards, and I felt so good, I'm going to start my kick. Man, so I start sprinting for the finish line, and I'm feeling really good. And you know, that's where all the people are at the finish line. All your family, all your friends, people who are there uh, watching the race, they're they're gathered at the finish line, so I want to finish well. And and I'm doing well until about 20 yards before the finish line, a six-year-old boy runs past me, (laughs) finishes ahead of me. I am so embarrassed. I am humiliated. I said I'll never again run a race. I'm done with that. Well, fast forward about 15 years. I'm about 35 years old. I'm pastoring a church, and once again, I start jogging, and I get in pretty good shape, so the inspiration hits me again. I'm going to run a race. So once again, I enter a 5K, and I'm running the race. Again, I'm not leading the race. but I'm not in the back of the race. I'm somewhere in the middle, and again, about 200 yards from the finish line, I'm feeling pretty good. 
I, I'm going to start my kick, but immediately I start thinking. I have a flashback. <laughs> there, there's no way a six-year-old boy is going to pass me. So I start my kick. And then again, about 20 yards before the finish line, it's not a six-year-old boy. It's a 67-year-old lady. Who passes me? And I, I'm so, I'm, I know you, she was 67. I know you never ask a woman her age, but I did. She told me, no, I'm 67 years old. I told, great, great. I mean, that's so good. Again, I'm humiliated. I'm frustrated. I am embarrassed. I said, that's it. No more race. But isn't it a lot like that in life? I, I'm talking about the Christian life. You're living your life. There are frustrations there are disappointments, there are setbacks, and there's always the temptation to drop out of the race. Look, you'll never lose your salvation, but sometimes we get discouraged. We get frustrated, and we want to quit. I want to encourage you today. Stay in the race. Run the race. As we look at this passage of Scripture this morning, I love the athletic imagery. Now, I like sports, I played sports, I watch sports, I am a fan of sports, but I'm not a fanatic. I'm amazed at some people today. I, I, mean, I mean, live or die. I mean, I, I've got my favorite teams, but it doesn't really affect my life whether they win or lose, you know, because I really don't have any skin in the game. But I, there's some people who live and die with it. That was the way it was in New Testament days. And the writer of Hebrews realizes this, writes about this. I, I mean, they were fanatics. We have our Olympics today. They had the Olympics then. Isthmus games, Pathanon games. You know, we have our Super Bowl that's coming up, the World Series, NBA Finals, and we have those Olympics. They had the Olympics, those track and field events. And one of the events was the marathon. They would start the marathon there by the... Coliseum, the remnants of those Coliseums of today, they would run that race through the city, through the countryside, and they would finish the race back in the Coliseum where all of the spectators were. Thousands were gathered. There's the emperor in his luxury box, and the athletes are competing on the field, and all of the fanatics are there. I mean, they're living and dying with these athletic events. Not much has changed, has it? Cicero, the historian, once wrote in dismay over all the attention and adulation athletes received. He said, athletes receive more attention and adulation than victorious generals returning from battle. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, that's, things haven't changed. That's the way it is today. So the writer of Hebrews takes this athletic imagery and, and he writes about running the race. And it's not a literal race. We know that. It, it's the race of life. Specifically, the Christian life. And then we see as we open the chapter, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, who are those witnesses? Well, you read the first verse in chapter 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, you always ask that question, what is it therefore? It usually represents what came before it, which was chapter 11, which was God's hall of faith, all the heroes of the faith, those who've already run the race, those who've gone before us. Yes, those heroes of the faith in chapter 11, but those who have gone before us, all of those who have run the race, they have completed the race. And it's if they are encouraging us to run the race with endurance and faithfulness. Now, I, some folks have commented on that and said, well, that's, you know, that's our family, that's our friends who've already gone to be with Jesus, who are in heaven, and they're all up there looking down on us. I'm thinking, hmm, they sure are going to be disappointed if they're watching me all the time. I mean, there's no disappointment in heaven, right? I mean, they're, they're going to be bored if they're watching me all the time. I love what Francis Chan said about this. Francis Chan said, they're in heaven. Jesus is on his throne. 
They're the angels and the cherubim and all the glories of heaven. Don't you think they're looking at that? Amen. I think they're looking at that. But I, I do think what he's talking about here is those who've gone before us, those who have run the race, and it's as if they're passing the baton on to us and encouraging us to run the race with faithfulness. So let's run the race. But the first question is this. We must enter the race. I've got to get in the race. How do I run the race? I must first enter the race. You must make that decision to enter the race. And you enter the race when you make that decision to follow Jesus, to trust in him. Well, that, there's folks around here entering the race. You, you see the results of that in baptism today where people made the decision to follow Jesus. Salvation is when you enter the race. L listen to this. Salvation is not the reward you receive at the end of the race. It's the gift that qualifies you for running the race. So when you trust Jesus, when you're saved, when you're born again, you enter the race. You enter the race of faith. Now, have you entered the race? I'm not saying you have to remember a date or a time, but there had to be a date or a time when you made that decision to follow Jesus. I, I can remember my date, December the 20th of 1981. After staying out all night at a Christmas party, I came home. Things were great. Things were good. God was blessing. And it was the goodness of God that led me to repentance. When I started realizing all these blessings that I had, I mean, it, I, I just, I can serve a God like that. I mean, I, God is so good, I realized that nothing was from my own strength, my own intellect, my own ability. It was all God. Now, my wife, I mean, she's a stronger believer than I am. I, I'm more mature than I am. It's a little bit embarrassing as a pastor to say that, but it's like I told the men, her faith is stronger than mine. And she loves Jesus, walks with Jesus, but she can't remember her date when she came to know Christ. Oh, she's got a baptismal date and she came to know Christ before then. She made that, but she knows she made that decision. There was a date. So was there a time, was there a date when you trusted in Jesus? When you gave your heart, your soul, your life to Jesus. If, if there wasn't, you can do that today. Today can be your day. Now can be your time and your opportunity when you place your faith and your trust in Jesus. But if you're going to run the race, first of all, you got to enter the race. There are a whole lot of people watching the race. And I'll tell you, churches are filled with spectators. Churches have spectators who observe the race. They think about the race. And then they might criticize the race or, or they just come to be entertained in the race. Let me encourage you. Get in the race. Trust in Jesus. Believe in him today. Secondly, we must overcome adversity in the race. Christian life is not a bed of roses, folks. Somebody once said the Christian life is hard. Christian life's not hard. Christian life's impossible. <laughs> I mean, uh, unless you live... Unless Jesus lives in and through you in the presence of his Holy Spirit. But you're going to face adversity. And that adversity is designed to grow you and mature you and to conform you into the image of Christ. So once we enter the race, we must then overcome adversity in the race. Notice verse 1, it says, Lay aside every weight that slows us down and every sin that trips us up. Notice those two things. Those, we must overcome adversity in the weight. Notice first in the race, notice first of all the weight. Some translations say hindrance. I heard about a runner who lost a race and he was complaining. He said, I was just a couple of pounds overweight. That's why I lost the race. Boxers are disqualified, what? For being just a pound, overweight. I spent one summer over 40 years ago in, a, in an NFL training camp, and, and you had a weight. You had to report at that weight. You could not be over that weight. If you were over that weight, you were fined $100 a pound a day until you got that weight off. 
That's 40 years ago. That's a lot of money today. But 40 years ago, I mean, they took that serious. And their weights that weigh on us, hinder us, slow us down when we're running the Christian race. And, and get this, might ne not necessarily be a bad thing. Might not necessarily be a bad thing. I, I mean, an overcoat, not a bad thing. It can be a good thing, but it's a hindrance for running the race. It says strip off every weight. You ever seen those runners come up to the, the starting blocks and they just strip off everything? They aren't wearing anything. I mean, even a marathon run in freezing temperatures, they'll have on gloves, a toboggan, and not much else. Nothing of a hindrance a weight should slow us down. I mean, you, you think about it. I think, you know, think, think about this thing. I mean, that, you know, I, I, I agree, that's of the devil. But we can redeem it and use it for God's glory. But, I mean, think about something like social media. In and of itself, it, it's, it, it's not evil, but it's so often used for evil. And even if it's used for good, it can be a hindrance. It can be a weight. It can slow us down. I mean, you know, sports, just watching sport all the time, giving all your time to that, all, or any hobby. There's nothing wrong with that. You need that. But if it consumes you, it can be a weight. It can be a hindrance. Now, notice the second thing is sin. Right? While a weight will hinder us and weigh us down, notice it says a sin will trip us up. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. You know, I, I, I may be a bigger sinner than you are, but we all sin and all fall short of the glory of God. And so he's saying here is, you know, lay aside every sin. Repent of that sin. Doesn't mean you'll be perfect after that. You'll still fall. You, you'll still get tripped up. But do your best in the power of the Holy Spirit to repent of that sin. Acknowledge, we talked about this week, you can't do it on your own. God's Spirit must enable you and empower you. You still will not be perfect, but do all that you can to repent of that sin. Turn from that sin. Don't let it trip you up. It's often been said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you there longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Good idea to repent of it. Get rid of it. One of the great hindrances and problems with distance running is fatigue. You hit the wall. And so often in life, sin saps us of our strength and vitality and energy. So lay aside every weight. Repent of every sin that hinders you in running the race that trips you up. Thirdly, we need endurance for running the race. We need endurance. Do you see that at the end of verse 1? Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Don't stop, my friends. Persevere. It's always too soon to quit. Don't give up. Don't give in. Revelation 2.10 says, Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Don't quit till you hit the finish line. And when do you hit the tape, the finish line? I've already said it, when we see Jesus, either in his coming or in our going, when we see him face to face, run the race. Napoleon Hill, who studied the life of many successful people, said there was one common trait of successful people. It wasn't energy. Uh, it, it, it wasn't ability. It wasn't even attitude as important as that is. That common trait was perseverance. Perseverance, endurance. Anybody read Max Licato? If you read his story, uh, that he couldn't get anyone to publish his first book. Publisher after publisher declined to publish his first book. Finally, someone published his book under these conditions. They wouldn't ask, he would not ask him to publish any more. Well, that publisher missed out, didn't he? 145 million copies later of, of over 100 books that he's written. 
perseverance. You heard the story of Norman Vincent Peale? I mean, Norman, power, positive thinking, whatever you think about that doctrinally or whatever, but he wrote the book, Power of Positive Thinking. Twelve publishers rejected it. He took the manuscript, threw it in the trash can. His wife said, let's try one more. One more. And the rest is history. Over 35 million copies of that book sold. Perseverance, staying with it. Getting up when you get knocked down. And we get knocked down, right? Get up. Get knocked down again. Get up. I love that story of a, a young college football coach. Young college football coach was about to go on his first recruiting trip. And the wise old coach brought him in and he said, all right, son, you're, you're going to that high school football game tonight. You're watching those young athletes and, and you're going to try and determine if some of them can play at the next level. Some of them can play on our team. And he said, the, I want to make sure you know what you're looking for. He said, suppose you have your eyes on one of those players. He's running down the field. He gets knocked down. He stays down. Do we want him? The young coach said, no, sir, we don't want him. He got knocked down and stayed down. The old coach said, you're right. But suppose that athlete, that football player is running down the field. He gets knocked down. He gets back up. But he gets knocked down a second time and he stays down. We want him. And the young coach said, no, sir, we don't want him. Even though he got up the first time, he, he didn't get up the second time. He stayed down. The old coach said, you're right. Then the wise old coach said, all right. Suppose that guy, that player is running down the field, he gets knocked down, he gets back up, 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 and he finishes the play out on his feet. Do we want him? And that young football coach said, yes, sir, he's the one we want. Every time he got knocked down, he got back up. And the old coach said, no, son, you're wrong. We want the one who's knocking him down. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we want the one who's knocking him down. But there's something about that guy that keeps getting back up. Isn't it something about the guy that keeps getting back up? And sometimes life can do that. Life can be cruel. I mean, circumstances, you know, people say, why is there so many problems in the world? Because it's the world. I mean, it's not heaven. One day there will be an absence of all of those things in heaven. But now there are problems because it is the world and because of sin. And get back up. When we get knocked down, get back up. How do we do that? In our own strength? No. The writer tells us there in verse 2, Look unto Jesus. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. When running a race, where you look is so important. And there are runners who are running a race who will do what? They'll look over their shoulder. They'll look at other runners. They'll look up in the stands at the spectators. A high hurdler who won a gold medal said, I don't even look at the hurdles. I look at the finish line. I look at the tape. I, I don't even look at the hurdles because they're going to be hurdles. You just keep clearing those hurdles. And if you get knocked down, you get back up and you finish the race. Some Christians look at other Christians when they're running the race. They'll let you down. Don't, don't look at other Christians. Yeah, be, be an influence, be an example. We've already heard that today. Yay. Being a positive influence, positive example can, you know, can help folks. But don't, don't look at other runners running the race. They're not your competition anyway. Don't, don't, you know, don't, don't, don't look at uh, the stands, the spectators. Don't, don't, don't ask what other runners think about your running. Don't, don't ask. Don't, don't look at your own form. How you're running. Uh, yeah, it's important to check out your life from time to time. But look to Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. Some translations say the finisher of our faith. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Jesus ran the race perfectly. He was without sin. He was tempted as we are in all areas. And he didn't sin. Oh, he was God. Yeah, he was God, but he was totally man. And, you know, he, he, he took on the limitations of a human being. He got tired just like we get tired. He got hungry like we get hungry. And he, you know, he was tempted like we were tempted, yet he was perfect. He was without sin. He is our perfect example. 
1 Peter 2.21 says to follow in his steps. Sid said it. Get up every morning. Put your eyes on Jesus. Trust Jesus. Depend on Jesus. Start your day with Jesus. Walk all that way with Jesus. See, if you know Jesus and he is in your life, he is your Lord and your Savior, you have the presence of Jesus and the person of his Holy Spirit within your life that can empower you and enable you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. I love that story of Peter. Don't you? When Peter walked on water, I mean, there it is. Jesus is walking on water. Peter gets out of the boat and walks to Jesus as long as his eyes were on Jesus. He was fine. As long as his focus was on Jesus. But what happened? He started looking at his circumstances just like we do. He noticed there was a storm going on. I mean, he, he noticed the waves and the wind and the thunder and the lightning and the way and the rain. And he what? He took his eyes off Jesus, put, it, put his eyes on his circumstances, and he started to sink. But there was Jesus. Reached down, grabbed him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Focus on him. Now, we have an opponent. It's not the other runners. It's not other Christians running the race. We have three opponents, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the system of the world, the flesh, that old nature that keeps raising its ugly head, and the devil. The devil is real. He will tempt you. He will try to disrupt your life. He will try to destroy you. He wants to defeat you in running the race. So keep your eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter, the completer of our faith. Jesus says it is finished. He finished the race successfully and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And notice it also says in verse 2, not only did he flawlessly run the race as an example for us, he endured the cross. There in verse 2, scorning and despising the shame that came with it. We'll suffer in the race. Jesus suffered. Now, we'll never suffer like Jesus suffered. Now, yeah, we might physically. He suffered horrible physical death. We, we might emotionally think about it, but we, not spiritually. Because Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us. Jesus suffered like no one, yet he endured the race. Focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus who endured the race. Then lastly, let's finish the race. Let's finish the race. At the end of verse 2, keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. Disregarding its shame, now he is seated in the place of honor. We'll be there with Jesus when we hit the finish line, when we finish the race. Too many drop out too soon. Too many fall late in the race. Don't finish until we see Jesus. The joy set before him, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. John 17, 4 says that Jesus glorified the Father by completing the work God gave him to do. He lived his life to the glory of the Father. Do we do, we do that? I mean, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says whatever we do, whatever we eat, whatever we drink, whatever we do, do so for the glory of God. That's what will produce joy. It it won't alleviate suffering or eliminate it, 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 but it'll produce joy. Jesus endured the cross, yet it says the joy. Notice the joy he experienced, even in suffering, in the crucifixion. It was this joy of exaltation because he glorified the Father. He lived his life to the glory of God. That's how you have joy in spite of your circumstances. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He finished the race. And he's still there. He's empowering us. He's encouraging us. He 
is enabling us to run the race. You see, we don't run the race for heaven. That's already ours if we're a believer. We run the race to glorify God, to give him glory in all that we do, to magnify the name of Jesus. That, that's why we exist. That's why we're here. Notice the words of Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. He says, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, Paul says, but for all. But for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So, friends, let's run the race. If you've not entered the race, enter it today, now, by placing your faith, your belief, and your trust in Jesus. And then run the race with perseverance and endurance. Lay aside that weight. Repent of that sin that's stripping you up. And run the race to the glory of God. Keeping your eyes on Jesus. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your goodness. It is beyond all that we can understand or comprehend. Thank you for salvation that's far beyond what we deserve. Thank you, Lord, that while we were yet sinners, you loved us. Jesus died for us. And by believing and trusting him, we can have eternal life. God, we just pray that you might be glorified through our lives. And God, I do pray today there's someone who needs Jesus, that today would be that day that they enter the race. For we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. <laughs> You're listening to a man that's walked with Jesus for a long time. A long time. You learn things as you go along, and uh, Eddie shares with us a lot of wisdom. If you don't know Jesus today, what is it that keeps you from making the most important decision of your life? Coming to church can be a distraction. Hmm. It can. Are you with me? You can come to church and think that you're walking with Jesus, but you only or just going about some religious duties. There's a difference when you know him personally and you can call on him. It makes the race a whole lot more. Religion to kill you, <clears throat> Jesus <clears throat> to save you. Amen. Amen. So if you don't know him, <clears throat> if you don't know him before you walk out those doors, you come see Eddie or I, <clears throat> we'd love to be able to tell you about our friend Jesus. Amen. Father, would you bless us as we walk out these doors? Father, as, as we go into the world to make a difference, to live out that which we say that we believe, may there be more to the story that we're passing on than just the words that we speak, but also the lives that we live so that others may come to know you and to know you personally. We are so thankful. Thank you for the blessings, the encouragement. Father, may you continue to spur us on with the words that we read in the Scripture and the privilege we have of being your children. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're a man, and listen, we'd love to have you come and join us at the next, at the next service, at least during that singing time. Isn't that right, Brian? Brian Broom said he'd like to have 150 guys up here at the next time. <laughs> at, least, at least that many. You guys have a great week. Amen. God bless. Thank you, brother.